Support for this program was provided by Appalachian Power, a unit of the American Electric Power System, serving customers in southwestern Virginia and West Virginia with energy, stewardship, and community. Additional support was provided by the Bedford County and Franklin County offices of Economic Development and by the members of Blue Ridge PBS. Thank you. We heard there was going to be a lake, and that was the dream. The dam sitting in that gorge is amazing feat to me. It's an ideal spot for one, and it turned into a marvelous recreation area. Seeing that water, though, was really something. Back up on your property, you know, we saw water trickling back on the land. The lake is very natural in its surroundings, and it has really healed itself from construction. It's as close to a natural lake as you could get. It's the most wonderful place to live that you can imagine. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, mosquitoes aren't too bad, uh, there's very few things can eat you, so it's just a wonderful place to live and raise children. I would say that Smith Mountain Lake truly is like the jewel in southwest Virginia. Smith Mountain Lake, 500 miles of shoreline, 40 miles long with a surface area of over 20,000 acres. Located in Bedford, Franklin, and Pennsylvania counties, it is an economic driver for the area. Many visit for recreation. Many call it Shore's home. Thousands of years before the lake, Native Americans inhabited the area. When I was in college at William & Mary, I corresponded with Carl Miller. Carl Miller did the archaeology for Smith Mountain Lake, and I remember one of the interesting things Carl told me was he was so impressed with the fact that he found so many flutes on the Smith Mountain Lake properties that the Indians apparently were very musical. The first recorded white settlers came to the area in the 1670s. Smith Mountain and ultimately the lake were named for two settlers, Daniel and Gideon Smith, who arrived on the mountain in 1740. Dating back to the pioneers of that century, on the north side of the Blackwater River in Franklin County stand the landmark twin chimneys built in 1795. Once part of the Gwyn Dudley home, they are on the Virginia and National Register of Historic Places. As the land was settled, it was primarily agricultural and would remain so for generations, up to the time construction of the lake took place. Throughout the area, tobacco barns and small family cemeteries still dot the landscape, signs of the area's rich history. This is the Roanoke River running here, north to south. And when I was a young boy, I used to ride pole boats up and down this river. And of course, we would pack our food and fish a little bit and look for our heads and swim a while. There was a mile long bottom where the water is today. One farm affected by the rising water was owned by the Bernard family. They raised tobacco and livestock. Cattle, mainly. But you know, you always have little piggies <laughs> and things like that. But my husband mainly was into Black Angus. He liked the cattle. When it started out, it was just all farm country and river bottoms with the river flowing through the mountains, you know, and they farmed the river bottoms, fished the river, and the people coming in now probably can't even visualize what it looked like then. It was country then. Now it's not. Talk of a dam in the gap at Smith Mountain began as early as 1906. It was officially proposed in 1924 when the Roanoke Stanton River Power Company was formed. The possibility of a dam being built affected business in the region, including a local railroad. 
the F and P was the Franklin and Pennsylvania Railroad, and it meandered down through the countryside here because the land goes up and down like a roller coaster in a lot of places. So they had to follow a path where it was more or less level. It started running on the 1st of May, 1880, and it ran until 1932 in April. It went on down through each little town or village, just like Glade Hill here. About the time the railroad was coming to an end, in um, 1928, a group of men that were trying to get the Pittsville branch to use for hauling lumber, they wrote a letter to the Southern, and they said in the letter they understood that those tracks, they probably wouldn't be able to lease them for an extended period of time because they were going to be used for hauling materials for the construction of a dam that they were planning on building on the river out on Smith Mountain coming through the gap. As it turned out, the uh, branch being extended over to the gap there in the mountain never did materialize. In the 1930s, it was concluded the dam wasn't economically feasible, but the idea of a dam in the gap didn't go away. Prompted by the need for flood control, in 1945, the Roanoke River Basin Association was formed to promote the construction of dams in the region, including a dam at Smith Mountain. Appalachian Power Company purchased the land and rights from the Roanoke Stanton River Power Company in 1954. The Federal Power Commission approved Appalachian's license in April 1960 for a hydroelectric power facility and the massive construction project that was to change the face of the area got underway. The Smith Mountain Pumped Storage Project consists of two dams and lakes. Using pencil and a slide rule, the double curvature arch dam on the Roanoke River at Smith Mountain was designed by 25-year-old Dr. Jeffrey Fong. It is 816 feet wide and 235 feet high, with five generating units that on average generate 435,000 megawatt hours per year. Downriver from Smith Mountain is Leesville Lake and Dam. The lake at 17 miles in length with 100 miles of shoreline is much smaller than the upper lake. The Leesville Dam is a concrete gravity dam with two generating units. During peak demand, water flows through Smith Mountain Dam to Leesville Lake to generate electricity. When demand is lower, the pumps can be reversed and the water returned to Smith Mountain Lake to be used again. When I went down there, the road wasn't even completed. The last two miles going into Smith Mountain, there was no road. They was clearing the stumps out of the road when I got there. And uh, the excavation contractor had, had already arrived, and he was working from the top of the mountain on the Bedford County side. I was just off the farm and applied for a job, and they put me with the engineers, and that just suited me to a T. I was fascinated about starting a project like that almost from the get-go. The river was still flowing through when I went, and just to see it constructed was real interesting. Initially, they had a microwave phone on a pole on the Bedford County side, but our little survey shack on the Pennsylvania County side, the only way we could get to the phone was a boat. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, pretty primitive. One of the key components of the Smith Mountain Dam is concrete. 175,000 cubic yards went into its construction. To facilitate moving the concrete and other materials, a cable over 1,000 feet long was put in place 325 feet above the riverbed. They mixed the concrete up on the hill. They didn't bring it in in trucks. They made it right there on site, way up on the mountain. They had a four yard and six yard bucket to drop the concrete from and a track that went from the batch plant to where the cable started and they could pick it up and carry it across to where the pole need to be. But the biggest thing I always thought when I first saw them do it, that how much six yards was, and then people just walk right up on top of it as, as if it was almost set up because it was so thick. I worked in the civil engineering department. We um, had to go out and check forms that the contractor put up to make sure they are perfect. and. Anything that's supposed to be in that form, such as pipe anchors, steel, we have to check all that, make sure they're in the right location. 
before we could sign it off to be poured in concrete. The dam was built up in concrete sections and we would go and survey everything related to as the dam was coming up, you know, climbing around on those ladders that you had to get to those pores. Sometimes a ladder would be almost straight up or worse than straight up and that was unnerving. It was very interesting to have the head of the concrete division come in the office and he would be talking about how many pours they were going to have and mixing it and the whole setup was amazing. You know, here these men are designing and setting up this pulley system that's on the side of the mountain. It was just amazing. It was dumped into lo real large containers that were swung up and down the river to whatever part of the dam was needed. And this was a railroad car built on tracks that would allow it to move up and down the river and it was anchored on the far side just into the hillside uh, must have been really anchored well because that cable would even move bulldozers around. When they pick that concrete up, that old cable would just, yeah, it was a lot of weight. Everything that went into the dam had to be set with the cable weight. Some of the machinery was huge. You had the pin stalks, which was the big tubes coming out of the dam into the turbines and you had your water wheel, you had your scroll case, and then you had your generators, your transformers. It was amazing to see things that they you know, would do down there, could do. After a stint in the Army, former tobacco farmer Abner Jacobs went to work at the Lower Dam, Leesville, in 1961. I transferred to the concrete lab at Smith Mountain Dam. It was seven employees worked at the concrete lab. Four on a day shift at three at night. And I worked at night. I would make up concrete cylinders. We would test those cylinders to see if the PSI was okay. The concrete was tested for strength in intervals of seven, 14, and 28 days, as well as six months. For several of the staff in the construction office, working at the dam was one of their first jobs. And for some, it put them on a lifelong career path. It was amazing how many people in Franklin County got a job and then went on and used it for the rest of their life, what they were taught down at the dam site. I don't think we knew at the time what the dam really was going to mean to Franklin County and the surrounding areas. I don't think nobody had had the vision to see what was going to happen with the results of it and it's marvelous. I had worked a little bit in surveying with a local surveyor in Rocky Mount, Virginia. I knew enough to be dangerous I guess so I was hired in in the survey team surveying different parts of the dam as it was constructed. Very interesting. We kind of worked as a group out of the construction office and made a lot of good friends. It was just a good job because I was a local kid just starting out and uh, it was a little different than, than going to work at one of your local factories and what have you. J.D. Butler worked as a timekeeper. Each one of us had so many men that we had to look after each day. If they worked 10 hours, 12 hours, you had to be there with them. Each time they moved, you had to change the description of what they was doing unless they worked in the same place you know, all day long. And after a while, you got to, you know, got to be good friends with all of them, and they, you know, they treated you just like you would want them uh, treat, to treat them. The ones I had were the general contractor. They were the ones who were actually building the dam itself, which took care of the building the forms to take care of the concrete when they poured it. Then I had the electricians, which took care of the putting in the conduit and wiring and stuff, which went in the concrete when it was poured. I transferred down to the office where I worked in the cost accounting office. I would compile the man hours where the timekeepers would 
bring in from out where they was keeping up with the time of the people working on the dam. I would take that information, compile it on a sheet, how much money we was going to owe that particular contractor for that given month. It was a construction site, but the girls that worked there and even the men in the office they dressed up and the girls dressed up with no such thing as blue jeans. I was secretary to the resident engineer, Earl Snodgrass. Appalachian benefited me in so many ways. The engineers just taught me so much about their jobs. It was to me better than a college education because I had this job and learned from the civil engineers, rode in the helicopter with the civil engineer, and I would take dictation as he was photographing and looking at the job site where the land was going to be underwater. And I even got to go under Hells Ford Bridge when it was finished. The helicopter went under the bridge before it filled up, of course. So it was just wonderful. And here I am. I have my own construction company now, so it was very, very instrumental to me. Joyce Kreider worked at the dam as a clerk typist then became the bookkeeper, dealing with millions of dollars. I was asked to go to be the bookkeeper, and it was quite something, because I had had bookkeeping, typing, shorthand in high school, but I had to be trained by her, and I wrote it all in a shorthand tablet, my notes, because she was leaving. There was nobody there to show me. It was interesting, because once I entered everything, the first month without her, you push a button, and if it doesn't come up zero, but it did. But I loved it. I loved it. Mr. Snodgrass was our resident engineer, and we loved him. And he was so good to us. He told us girls, you got, you got my permission to wear shorts. And he said, we're going to take you on a boat ride. And it was wonderful to be able to see all of that water and, and to be on it. That's the first time I'd seen all of that since I'd been working there. And I'd been working there five years at that time. Many of the staff carpooled to get to work at the dam. Appalachian had a fleet of station wagons that picked people up all over Franklin County and drove them in a carpool to work and brought us home in the afternoon. It was very nice to have that because keep in mind, we were at a construction site and it was dusty, very dirty. And when it rained, it was muddy. <laughs> and when it rained a lot, it was really muddy. It took about 45 minutes, maybe, or 50 from Rocky Mount to get to the dam site. So it was, that was fun as well, <laughs> riding back and forth with them. Workers at the dam site had company in the form of local wildlife. We had a wild goat there on the mountain, and he was quite an attraction for the uh, people but you didn't see him too often until we put a nanny goat up there. Then we had little goats. That old goat, he was, he was quite a character. You know, when you work in an office, I don't care where it is, where it was then or now, if somebody comes in and says something unusual, oh, you do see us outside, and everybody gets up and goes out. So we would go out to the front door if the goat was out there. I saw the goat many times many times. He used to come out on up on top of the mountain, up on the rock and what have you, and just kind of watch in the evenings. One time the goat started down on the pour where they was pouring concrete, which is probably up 150 feet above the riverbed, and some of the people got the bright idea that they was going to run that goat off of that dam. Wrong. The goat got mad and came down and ran everybody off <laughs> because it didn't like the noise. Simultaneously, while both dams were under construction, land was being prepared for the reservoirs. A key part of that was the three-year cemetery relocation project. Appalachian employees Herbert Taylor and Curtis Roberson scoured the area, many times dealing with rough terrain and land choked with briars, Honeysuckle and Periwinkle. In the report Roberson filed with Appalachian on the project, he writes that many of the graves were on former family farms in plots that had long been abandoned and forgotten. 
they had to avoid the snakes and the ticks and the barking dogs and figure out whose property this was and that kind of thing and figure out is there a cemetery here? And then they would find field stones, they would find sunken graves, they would find all these things. And then he would go through the process of researching it. So he'd go to the deeds, figure out who owned that property at any given time, and try to find the families. He would interview neighbors who'd been there for a long time, trying to figure out, okay, who lived here last? He would then kind of contact people and say, okay, it seems like your ancestor might be buried here. Do you want us to move your ancestor? They had contacted a lot of the different churches in the area. Most of the churches were on higher ground, like Stanton Baptist, for example, or Pat Miss Methodist. So there's a lot of the people, especially those that are unmarked, that were relocated to these neighboring churches. Bedford County, Pennsylvania County, Franklin County. They moved over 75 cemeteries. Now sometimes he couldn't figure out who they were, so he just kind of identified them as unidentified adult, unidentified child and they still moved them. Sometimes they found little teacups, sometimes they would find wedding rings, and they would bury those. And he did everything within his power to relocate every black person, every white person, former slaves. In the end, over 1,300 graves were moved, including the grave of Charles Carter, George Washington's nephew by marriage. Meticulous records were kept of each grave moved, which was part of Joyce Crider's first job at Smith Mountain Dam. They were large, large, long books, and the papers would come into the office, and then they were, of course, given to me. And I had to write in the ledgers, we called it, or the land ledgers. We had to write in there the dates, and I had to put the names in there. In addition to moving graves, a wide swath was cleared around what would become the shores of Smith Mountain and Leesville Lakes. I started out in the engineering department working with the engineering survey guys. At one point we went up on the reservoir and uh, took a little camping trailer and our job for the next year was to check the contractor that was doing the clearing around the lake. He was in the right area and clearing the right land around the, where the water was coming to and what have you. When they cleaned out all the way around this lake they only cleaned down so far. They didn't go to the pump bottom. So there are trees and everything in the bottom of the lake. Uh, we you know, could see the, all that going on. There was a certain clearing level that was from the ultimate level of the water down about 28 feet that was totally cleared. The trees were topped if they were above that level. And other than that, those trees are still in there, I guess. It was done with, with bulldozers and inloaders, whatever it took, to cut the trees and bulldoze it up. And that's pretty much what they did all the way around the lake, except, you know, there were some places which is very steep and rocky that you couldn't take bulldozers or what have you, but the vegetation stuff was cut around it. We were up in the reservoir running the contour line, which was to be cleared for the water to come up to the projected level and fortunately it did, you know, it worked out real good. I've heard people comment that they were surprised they built docks in the woods before the water came up, you know, and it came right up to them. I can remember growing up, it was always a treat on Sunday afternoon to ride down and see what they were doing. You know, you had these uh, hillsides that were scraped down. Then you had the Hills Ford Bridge, which was so tall compared to the bridge prior to that time. But it was a sight to see for people like us that had not ever seen anything of this magnitude taking place in our back door here. As part of the Smith Mountain Lake project, 22 miles of new roads were built, as well as six bridges, including Hardy Road, Brooks Mill, Toller's Ferry, and Hales Ford. I was very fortunate growing up that my dad worked for Appalachian Power Company and he would load us up in the car on Saturdays and he would start driving us around and there was no water in the lake of course at that time and he would say okay now when the lake fills up this house is going to be under the water or this farm's going to be under the water he would drive us up certain roads and he would say okay you know this is not going to be here once the dam fills up one of the Smith family's trips was captured on film. 
It's my sister, my mom, and myself, and we're sitting under Hales Fort Bridge. It had just been completed. Mom's sitting on a bale of hay. We're having our picnic, and it was just a great, there was no water, no water in the lake at that point in time. On September 20th, 1963, the gates at Smith Mountain Dam were closed and the water began rising. Each time you'd visit, it was higher and higher and higher. And then you began to see like the old bridge and all that. Those landmarks disappeared. We saw the water flow back on this property just a few days after they closed the dam, you know. And my husband had tears. And it's funny how many years, 50 years, <laughs> it makes you sad. Watching the smoke and the debris all over the area was something to see when they were clearing. And then watching the lake back up and the skimmers were just constantly working for about three years, picking up that debris that floated up. When we wanted to go swimming, we would usually have to push the debris out of the way, but the water was, was wonderful. And it was a wonderful thing to see, but at the same time, it was a sad thing to see it covering up our riverbeds and things that we had such a great childhood on. We used to swim up there, the old Fort Edmund, halfway up. You can swim out there and get in a tree limb, <laughs> sit on a tree limb if you wanted to. As the lake was filling up, we would sail, with the permission of the Bernards, right in their cow field, and we'd use a state road. And it was kind of interesting, because week after week, we'd bring our trailered sailboats, we'd just use the road. And the road slowly, surely disappearing as the lake levels rose. And that was our half mile long launching ramp and we got to see the lake actually fill up. And one of the neatest things was sailing through the treetops when the lake was like 50 feet lower than it is now. My best friend, her family moved from Philpot Lake to Smith Mountain Lake on the very year that it filled up. And we would go out there and water ski in between the treetops, whatever else was floating out there in the lake at that point in time. But we had a wonderful time and I wouldn't trade those years for anything. Smith Mountain Lake reached full pond, 795 feet above sea level at 5.03 a.m. on March 7, 1966. And just as the people were drawn by the waters of the lake, so were the businesses. Marinas and campsites popped up all around the lake. The first campground, Eagle's Roost, is still in operation today. One of the first marinas on the lake was Smith Mountain Dock, which is known all across the lake for its fish. You know, we, at the beginning it was a dirt road that came on this property and people would bring their cornbread and their biscuits to feed the fish. The fish was here before the marina was ever built. They've been here ever since. I love the fish and people come and feed our carp we are a family-oriented marina, and they come and they have so much fun. Fred Munson and Louise Munson, he worked at the dam, and his life dream was to have a marina on this lake. Once the lake was flooded in 1966, that's the reason that I'm here today, because of him. We've had people coming here from Russia, Australia, from England, but a lot of people from northern states, southern states, and I can tell where they're from by what the food they order. They should put some sauerkraut on my hot dog. I said, you from Jersey, how'd you know? Another early marina was Lakeside Marina. We had been going to Philpot, and my first impression going on this lake, it was huge compared to Philpot. It just seemed like a large, large body of water. I started building docks up here in 1965. I put a pile drive on the lake in 1967. I bought this place in 1968 and built it and we opened it in the spring of 69. It was a little space of field and the rest was trees. 
nothing else was here. There was nobody on the road coming down here. In fact, when we first started coming, once you turned off Route 40 with dirt roads, and that's about three miles from here to uh, 40. There was woods and a few fields. I drove down the edge of a field to get in here. When I brought the metal in for that building behind me, a farmer pulled me in here with his tractor and I had mud up on top of a 66 Chevrolet's hood. Had the metal on a trailer. The farmers thought we were crazy. We paid $1,000 per acre for the land and the farmers here thought we were totally out of our mind, including our banker. <laughs> But we took the plunge and I bought the land and started building the marina. My kids grew up with a life jacket on. We lived above the marina when we built the marina and my first son was there. And so if he wanted to go outside, he would run and get his life jacket and hand to me to put it on before he went outside. And he even uh, played in the snow with the life jacket on. <laughs> he would slide down on it like a sled. <laughs> Over the years, the marina has continued to grow from having boats moored with tires in the cove to what it is today. People got bigger boats, and uh, we built slips for 14-foot boats, and all of a sudden we had 18-foot boats. And then we built slips for 18-foot boats, and all of a sudden we had 25-foot boats. So it, you just had to constantly change with the times and rebuild and build again and so forth. And that's what makes it hard now, because you can't at will just change with, with the market. It's still a beautiful place. It's a good place to raise your family. It was the idea of raising a family on the lake that drew the Zahn family to Pelican Point. Originally opened by Mr. and Mrs. Bill Giles, grading for the campground began while the lake was still filling. We came here in 1974. I was 16 years old. We were living in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. My father was a nuclear physicist and he wanted to get out of that line of work to do something that was more family oriented for us, something outdoorsy. So my grandfather lived in Lyndhurst, New Jersey, and he saw Pelican Point advertised in the Wall Street Journal. So that's how we found it. I was excited about the move because I've always liked change. And I lived in a tent the first year that we were here, in a two-man tent because there was no place for me to live. All these houses that you see everywhere, they weren't here. You know, we had maybe some trailers across the way, that kind of thing. It was very quiet. We sold bait and um, had our little grocery store up the hill. And our campsites ranged from $3. I think the most expensive one was maybe 5 or $6. So big difference. The Zahn family had a passion for sailing. They extended that interest to others in the region with boat shows at the Roanoke Civic Center. In the beginning, we would go to the Civic Center there and be parked out in the parking lot. And we'd prepare for weeks, washing boats and waxing. But we had to be outside because we couldn't get all the boats, all the masts inside. <laughs> it was that love of sailing that changed Pelican Point from a campground to what it is today. In 1981, they changed it to Pelican Point Sailing Center. Then we were just, just sailboats, no powerboats at that time. And then as time went along, started building the clubhouse, you know, and the pool, all these things came along at different times. Then in 1985, it was Pelican Point Yacht Club. My parents built this and it's, I don't want to get teary, but you know, people come to me all the time and tell me how wonderful it is and what a beautiful place it is. I keep hearing all the time, it's the best kept secret on the lake. And it is, it's a beautiful place. And the lake is still, still beautiful. We need to take care of it, you know, and make sure that it stays nice and we don't abuse it. But um, it's my heart. I love it here. Others interested in sailing found the lake early on. The Virginia Inland Sailing Association was started by Ray Dietz when he transferred to the area. We arrived in Martinsville, and I have been sailing since 1949, and we had a 19-foot sailboat. And the first thing I did was look for water, and there really wasn't much of any. And I looked, who else around here sails? So myself, Dr. Bondurant, and Dr. Warren Mormon were the three that started the club. We signed our first uh, lease in December of 1965. They came by the house and asked my husband if he'd be willing to sell some land or cooperate with the sailboat club. My husband said, oh yeah, we'll just have to keep my cattle in. <laughs> my father had always been interested in sailing and had built a sailboat when he was a teenager. And I think when the lake filled up, 
It was like his greatest dream come true because we had wandered around in different little small, literally fish ponds trying to sail with little success. And so he got into it with this sailing group and we all kind of loved it. It's what we did on the weekends. In 1969, we had our first sailing camp. Since then, they've developed a really strong junior program and they go on into racing with the older people and so forth. I'm a second generation. My kids, which are the third generation, have grown up down here. And when I was a kid, we would go sailing at night down here with a flashlight. We would camp on an island out here, sail a little boat by ourselves. My grandchildren have both been to the junior sail camp and now they're in college. My son was five or six when we first came down here and sailed with us regularly. And my daughter was here from the time she was six weeks old at her first race. <laughs> Classed as an educational organization, Visa works with colleges and other organizations to provide sailing opportunities. One of the other programs we have are the Sea Cadets out of Lynchburg. They're sponsored by the United States Navy, and these are youngsters that are from the inner city and high school there where they can come and participate, not just in sailing, but some of the other drills that they do. So we're a self-help club, so we do most of the work ourselves. And so every single facility that we have was built by our members. I was a 12-year-old kid, you know, digging footings with picks and shovels and everybody working together as part of a, you know, little community of sailors was really a lot of fun. We came down here and we trimmed trees, we dug holes and we built docks. And so it was very, very much a Thing where we involve working together as much as playing together. It's just been a wonderful life and it's been a wonderful way to bring up three children and now some grandchildren even though they don't live close by. There's three generations of family that has learned to sail here. We've been here for 50 years so we have very traditional ideas in our club and one of them was that our gate had to be locked all day all night, all the time. And someone came and said, you know, it would just be so much easier if we could leave our gate open. And I said, why, why can't we? And the, most of the people there said, well, it's in our lease, and we lease from Mrs. Bernard. She is the final authority. So I called her and I said, Flo, please tell me, do we need to keep our gate locked at all times? She said that's when the cows were there and they came and went freely and we had to be so careful not to let the cows out. At that time we had no buildings, we had docks only, only a few, and the cows sure enough were there. Communities like Manita have experienced a lot of change with the coming of the lake. Longtime resident Calvin Woodford was born on a farm next to where he lives now. During his career, he ran a poultry operation, raising 90,000 broilers and 28,000 laying hens. He then went on to open an area staple, Monita Farm and Home, in the early 70s, which is still run by his family today. Woodford remembers early newcomers to the lake encountering local tobacco production. They would cut it and put it on sticks and put it up in there, and it was cured with smoke, build a fire, Snuff it out, smoke this road. After people move down here, they drive up the road and see smoke coming out of a building, they call the fire to come. <laughs> uh, so we had to educate them. The Manita Fire Department and Manita Medical were both started by the Ruritan Club. I'm a 60 year member of the Ruritan Club and I've seen it progress. And without the changes, I don't probably wouldn't have been able to continue the work we do. We were instrumental in getting a good bypass around Manita. We sat in the back of a pickup for a week counting cars and trains to convince the VDOT that they needed it. By then the lake was in and there were traffic jams. Trains would come through. People would be backed up a half mile. The lake brought big change to the many farms still along its shore. The Bernards moved to Bedford and the old family home would eventually become the Bernard's Landing Clubhouse. However, long before developers built condos and the lake was still new, 
the Bernards built a special place to stay. We call it the little house. My husband built that before the lake ever came in. How he knew where to build it, I don't know, but he hid it pretty well. Mom and Dad and some other people drew it out on a paper napkin and he built a boathouse. We purchased the Flo Ann, named after our two daughters. And uh, then we decided to put a little unit above the boathouse. And my sister and I would sleep in the boat underneath and listen to the waves at night. And so we thought we were cool doing that. <laughs> and it's still with us. I can't believe it. One of the other many farms in the area affected by the water was the Jones Farm. It was 248 acres. And the cove here split it, split it all. It's 47 acres plus on the other side and 78 something plus year. They kept the prop there and they just give the Appalachian right to flood it. They kept the land all the way to the bottom of the lake. The 800 mark come right to the corner of the foundation. It was probably a couple of feet from the foundation. So when the house movers come in to move the back of the barns, they didn't decide to go on and move the house up on top of the hill. People come in want to know if they could rent a lot or could they set up a tent or something of them. We had some people from Murray, first of all, and started renting out there in the yard so the house was moved. We had lots on both sides. Had a few over here, probably 12, 15 lots over here, and there's probably 75 to 100 on that side of the lake where the Cape is now. It's kind of, you know, new to all of us around, and Dead and him, I think, was one of the first when the lake started backing up. They went to uh, Greensboro and bought a boat. <laughs> a lot of the neighbors around and the kids would come help work any crops to get to go boat riding, you know. We had some good times with it. Business grew around the lake in the early years, but the big building boom began in the 80s. It was just so different than it is now. You know, even after the lake completely uh, flooded and people gradually from the Roanoke and Lynchburg, Martinsville area began to experience, hey, this is kind of a neat place to go, but it wasn't an easy place to get to. Our first piece of property was in the Gills Creek area. We had a little floating dock and we stayed in a pop-up camper. That's just the, the way life was then. You really had to prepare to come to Smith Mountain Lake for a weekend or even a day because there was no infrastructure here. We used to drive from Bedford over here. We would meet maybe one vehicle, and it would be a couple little stores along the way. With Bernard's Landing and Vista Point arriving on the scene and the waterfront, that's where the big changes really started to take effect. Then things just started to develop and grow, and that's where we are today, a lot of change. When we came, there was no Bernard's. There was the Bernard family home, and we watched those condos on the point go up and we were just astonished. There's a lot more activities now in the lake. There's swim-a-thons and wine festivals and all kinds of lake-centered things that are wonderful. The buildup of commercial and, and homes around it, I, I never envisioned it going that far, you know. Particularly the, uh, what's now called Westlake, I mean, there was actually hardly anything beyond the Booker T. Washington Memorial and going to Scruggs, and it was really rural. A lot of our economy is geared to the lake right now. And I tell people that, you know, magicians can pull a rabbit out of a hat, but we did one better. Ron Willard built a town out of a cow pasture. The first stoplight and then the next stoplight and the whole Westlake community, there was, when we were coming down here, a filling station on the corner where you turned, and an old brick plantation type house on the other corner. But now it's lots, lots, lots more. It's a whole community. When we first built, it was just hardly anything at Westlake. So it's wonderful what's happened with everything that the lake has brought into Franklin County. There's Everything you think of, banks, restaurants, you name it. I mean, everything just boomed. We had Food Line and Kroger and a CVS store, and stores I can't even imagine would have been here when I was a kid. So it's, it's grown. 
Just as the lake changed the face of the region, developer Ron Willard Sr. changed the area around the lake. Over 3,000 acres, 35 miles of shoreline, putting smiles on a lot of people's faces. I've watched people come and retire at Smith Mountain Lake. I've watched them grow old with their families. I've watched their kids come in and take over those properties and put a smile on their faces. And it's just such a joyful job I got. The things that I'm so proud of is being able to have the wisdom and the strength and the maybe the finesse to be able to get the banks to agree to loan me the money to move forward. So to be able to bring golf to Smith Mountain Lake, to be able to bring the first townhouses to Smith Mountain Lake, the first condos to Smith Mountain Lake, the first Nantucket villages to Smith Mountain Lake, the first boardwalk to Smith Mountain Lake, the first grand villas to Smith Mountain Lake. It's just been the, the pride of my life. Well, I've been very fortunate to be born in Franklin County, to be raised on a tobacco farm, to be able to watch the lake fill up, to ride my bike across a bridge every day when I got home from school until the water got so deep that the bike couldn't go through the water, and to sit around and fish with my grandfather and listen to him tell me when the time I was 10 years old that there's going to be a beautiful beautiful body of water here one day when they build this thing called Smith Mountain Lake and he would point up above on, from the river banks to the big tall sycamores and he would say young man one day there'll be water over top of those sycamores if you will use your head you can take that water and put it to an advantage that was a tip from granddaddy like other parts of the lake a lot of changes have come to the Halesford Bridge area with the coming of Bridgewater Plaza we purchased the land in uh, 1987. At that time, this was basically trailers. When I purchased the land, the county put a requirement on that I have the trailers removed, which I did. And then I hired an architect, and, and, and we came up with a plan for what we'd like to put here, and we built it the following 10 years after that. We have restaurants, we have a miniature golf course built out over the water, which is unique. We have gift store, art gallery, sportswear store, a marina with anything you'd want to do for a boat. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce is here. Full and part-time people have moved here, but it's becoming more and more a full-time lake all the time. I've been to just about every major lake up and down the East Coast, east of the Mississippi, and this is by far the nicest lake I've ever been. I mean, it's clean, it's beautiful, it's well-managed, and just a good quality of people live here. There's no shortage of things to do or places to visit around and on Smith Mountain Lake. Plying the waters of the lake since May 1989 is the 19th century replica side wheeler, the Virginia Dare. You'll also find fishermen on the water just about any time of the year. In fact, the lake was stocked with fish before it reached full pond. They have big stripers in this lake and, uh, and there's some big largemouth, but you've got to be in the right spot with the right bait to catch them, but they are here, trust me. We put on tournaments throughout the year through our bass club, who is real drag bass anglers, just to, as a get together open to the public. It's camaraderie and competition. A popular attraction located on the north shore of the lake in Bedford County is Smith Mountain Lake State Park. Open year-round, the park covers over 1,100 acres. Appalachian Power donated the first parcels of land after the lake was full, and then Commonwealth bought and purchased the rest of the land. And through the 70s, there was construction for roads and infrastructure, and the park opened to the public in 1983. You can do a whole host of outdoor recreational activities while you're here. There's hiking trails, biking trails, picnicking. We have one of two public swim areas on the lake. So through the summertime, we're very busy with swimmers. And then we have a boat ramp. So lots of people launch here and recreate through the, through the lake. And then we also have a discovery center. We have lots of interpretive programs through the summer. We have a campground and the cabin area. And that was constructed in the 90s and it's very very popular activity for people. 
The park is a good place to relax and to observe the wildlife both in person and on camera. For the last four years, we've had uh, the Osprey camera on a live feed on the web. So you could go to a Ustream site and actually see what's going on inside the nest. So it's a great opportunity for people to, to view uh, a nest location that otherwise they wouldn't have an opportunity to see. Across the lake from the State Park in Franklin County is Smith Mountain Lake Community Park, which opened in June 2007. The park offers facilities for a variety of activities, including swimming, picnicking, leisurely strolls, and fishing. Before it was completed, Appalachian Power Company donated land for what was to become another fixture on the lake, the W.E. Skelton 4-H Educational Conference Center. The center was officially dedicated in 1965 and has grown tremendously since, adapting to the needs of its visitors with state-of-the-art educational and recreational facilities. With the ability to house and feed over 400 campers at one time, the 4-H Center provides programs to youth from around the region and beyond. In addition, the center is used by students from Virginia Tech, the business community, and more. I was a 4-H'er myself in school, and I learned a lot there. So when the 4-H came here, the company I worked for at that time built the first building. And to have this much land on the waters of Smith Mountain Lake and the kids coming in from all over, being able to boat, kayak, fish, swim, do all those things in the lake, these kids never see. So I enjoy that part of the summer going over and visiting with the campers. So I want to make sure that 4-H continues in, in this region because it's such a common sense builder. The lake area is also home to a national park. The Booker T. Washington National Monument opened in 1956. It offers a look back to the early life in Franklin County. This plantation was 207 acres, which was about average size for a Piedmont, Virginia uh, tobacco plantation. Tobacco was the cash crop. Everything else was grown for subsistence to be used here on the farm or to be bartered and traded with neighbors. This is the place where Booker T. Washington was born, born into slavery. He lived here as an enslaved boy for the first nine years of his life. He endured the Civil War, and then this is the place where he was freed. He became the premier black educator in America in the late 1800s and early 1900s. There's lots to see and do. Visitors come here, they see the orientation film, they can experience an interactive exhibit, then they can go outside and see the reconstructed farm area with uh, live animals, heirloom gardens, demonstration crops, reconstructed buildings, to really get a sensory experience of what life would have been like for Booker T. Washington and other people living on this farm in the 1800s. The lake has brought recreation, business, and homes to the area. It has also been the genesis of a variety of organizations, promoting everything from safety to regional cooperation to the lake itself. Smith Mountain Lake Marine Fire Rescue was founded in 1975. We were formed to protect the lives, land, and property on Smith Mountain Lake, as well as the guests that come to the lake. We are completely volunteer. We're one of the largest all-volunteer marine fire rescue companies in the nation. The land, see all the land around us. We are responsible for everything a thousand feet from the 795 USGS as, as first call along with our partners. We have mutual aid agreements with 13 agencies that are on the land. And so anything that happens on the water that involves saving a life or protecting property, fires, EMS, respond to various calls, anything from a boat accident to people in trouble, house fires, brush fires, you name it. We respond to all of them. We have seven fire boats, five of which are ISO rated. That helps the community save money on homeowners insurance as well as the marinas and commercial establishments that are located on the water. We have a great group we're always looking to add to that group. We enjoy what we do. Formed in 1986 as a group fostering regional cooperation is the Tri-County Lakes Administrative Commission. TLAC's a grouping of four counties that come together on the lake. It's uh, Pennsylvania County, 
Franklin County, Bedford County, and Campbell County. The Board of Supervisors at each of those counties has designated TLAC to try to handle issues that are related to the lake. One organization can do it much better than four individual organizations. TLAC has worked on a wide range of projects since its inception, including prevention of invasive aquatic vegetation, navigational aids around the lake, water quality monitoring, and much more. It's such an environmentally friendly area, and we're looking at last year's results of testing, and the, the lake is in phenomenally good condition, which is an anomaly for a lake that's 50 years old almost. The counties all, I think, recognize Smith Mountain Lake as a big tourist attraction. It is a big economic draw, and it's something that all of our people love. So they, they want us to help uh, preserve that, make sure it goes forward in the future, and we think it'll continue to grow and be a place people want to come, live, live out their retirement years, and just come to visit. Another organization that works to ensure the future of the area is the Smith Mountain Lake Regional Chamber of Commerce. The chamber started actually as the Smith Mountain Lake Business Partnership is what it was called and that was in 1986 and we had pretty much the entire business community that took part in it immediate. It was a success from the very first day. The chamber has nearly 700 members and is dedicated to promoting tourism and growing business on the lake. I know for myself, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the lake. So many people that you speak to would never have found this area if it wasn't for the lake. With the moderate climate, the mountains, 500 miles of shoreline, all of these things combined probably gives us the greatest quality of life that anybody could even imagine. I've been here for 30 years. We had a choice of choosing anywhere in the world that we wanted to go. And so we researched and we were looking for an area with a great climate that would give us um, great education. Must be a lake, must be near mountains, with four seasons, we found paradise. Constructed at a cost of $66 million, the Smith Mountain Lake Pumped Storage Project is so much more than just a facility to generate electricity. It generates jobs, providing a livelihood for many in the region. It has generated more than 50 years of golden memories, of farms long gone, of sailing, camping, and bringing in people that now call it home. Support for this program was provided by Appalachian Power, a unit of the American Electric Power System, serving customers in southwestern Virginia and West Virginia with energy, stewardship, and community. Additional support was provided by the Bedford County and Franklin County offices of Economic Development and by the members of Blue Ridge PBS. Thank you.